Folks, hello. I'm Matthew Kahn. I'm an economist at the University of Southern California, and it is uh, it's the end of March. I don't even know what date it is, uh, 2022. And I am delighted to have the chance to have a conversation with an old friend of mine who I'm very glad to be reunited with, who will introduce herself in a second. I um, Part of our conversation will talk about themes in my new book. I'm going to wave this at you, Going Remote how the flexible work economy can improve our lives in our cities. And the University of California Press will publish it in late April, 2022. And I'm delighted to introduce in a moment, my old friend Adele Bin, who is a, a very successful professional. Uh, I want to find out if she's ever worked from home. And she's told me that work from home has been part of her family for several generations. So Adele, uh, please, please say, say hello to everyone and please introduce yourself. Well, hello to everyone who is watching, who is smart enough to be watching this, because the things you talk about, the themes you bring to the fore in this book are absolutely crucial. A um, little bit of background, born and raised in what was the Valley of Heart's Delight and then became Silicon Valley. So I've been here since day one. My husband and I attempted to start a company with a bank loan, and we went to the banker and said, we have this great idea. You can take data, and you can analyze it, and you can make money with it. And the best part is, after you use the data, it's still in the bucket, even after you've poured it out. And the banker said, and I quote, if you're talking to me about canned peaches, I could make you a loan, but data, it isn't worth anything. So my husband and I are actually thinking of doing a series of memoir pieces <laughs> called Back When Data Was Worth Nothing. But that is beside the point from this new revolution, which is working from home. Yes, Matt, I have worked from home for the last two years. Uh, and prior to that, three years prior to that, I also worked from home because we shifted our company and I went to work for a new company and was there part-time in the office and then worked from home. Actually built myself a little space so I can work from home, which I'm in right now. Three things, three things really hit me. You know me, I, I tend to make lists. <laughs> Thing number one, isolation versus integration. You talk a lot about this in ways you may not even realize. So we'll get to further into that. Rigidity versus flexibility and rootless versus rooted. So those were three big themes that I found throughout your book. And two unexpected things that I'd like to talk about is English as a universal language, is it really? And how do managers learn to manage in a world where it's split between work from home and work on site? And by the way, I've come up with a little set of letters for work on site, WOS, o -W -O -S. And I think a lot of those people who are working from site because they're, they are the people fulfilling our Amazon orders. They're the people cooking our burgers. They're the people cleaning our houses. They're the people driving the trucks that move the stuff. Those people are suffering a lot of woe. And it's time we paid attention to them as well. Lots of good talk in here about professionals and people can work from home and blah, 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 blah. But we need to see both sides. And I appreciate the fact you do, you do recognize that. But we need to drill maybe a little deeper. So that's so, a good start. Where shall we go from here? So Adele, tell, me, tell, tell our millions of listeners, we hope, <laughs> uh, the backstory <laughs> about your family. If it was a mother or a grandmother who engaged in work from home long before Zoom. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I had a uh, very unusual French born grandmother who came to the United States illegally. Um, she left France illegally because you shouldn't get on the boat unless you're 18. She was 16, possibly 17. 
she borrowed her sister's ID card and got on the boat. And she came to America, got a job as a lady's maid, came across the country. And when she got to San Francisco, she went to the head of the household who handled servants, and that would be the woman. And she said, I have to resign. Now they had just paid her ticket all the way across the country. They had a room for her. She was supposed to take care of all the lady maid duties. And the woman said, why? And my grandmother who had learned English in the three months it took them to go from New York to San Francisco by train, stopping frequently, said, because the men talk about me in the wrong way. They remark on my tiny waist and my beautiful ankles and my lovely eyes. I must leave your employment. Now, my grandmother somehow magically got to an employment hall within moments, that's the way the story is told, with a letter of reference, evidently, from that lady. And she was immediately hired to be a, a child binder. They called them nannies in those days. And she did that for six years. And then when she married grandpa, she had to learn how to cook because she was useless in the kitchen. But by the time they were burned out of their vineyard in the Santa Clara, Santa, uh, Santa Cruz Mountains. They went to San Francisco in 1905. And that's when she opened her first work from home experience. She did a lunchroom because they were located just south of market where a lot of guys came into work and they needed food and they couldn't afford the expensive food. So they would sign up with her and she had lunch for them every day. <clears throat> The earthquake came and my grandparents lost everything except their two children, uh, a trunk full of souvenirs that my grandfather grabbed the wrong trunk, it didn't have the clothes, um, and a sewing machine because he couldn't open the drawer to get the address of their friends in San Jose. They stayed in the tents for a while, they got in touch with their friends in San Jose and they moved to this beautiful city and set up on the corner of market in San Fernando Street. On the second floor, there was housing. First floor was all commercial. And grandma opened her second lunchroom and made a lot of money, fortunately. And when they moved to a house, she kept chickens and she sold eggs. And oh, by the way, she bought the lot next door and built a house and rented it out for years and then got tired of being a landlady. And so she sold the house. So in my family, uh, on the French side, there's that. On the German side is my wonderful German grandmother, who was not always well rated in our family, unfortunately. We thought of her as very stern. Those were the stories that came down. But then I learned more about her. Her husband died when she was in her mid 40s and she had five children. And he and she had just started a new business here in Santa Clara County. They were running a chicken hatchery. Uh, imagine going from the work at home concept of the little hen sitting on the nest to these huge boxes that could produce thousands and thousands of baby chicks at a time. And grandpa dropped dead of a heart attack. And grandpa was gone and the business was there and grandma rose to the challenge. She not only ran the business and saved the business, she took care of the kids. She was a terrible cook, by the way. Everyone remarked about how awful her cooking was. And I'm really glad because she had energy and time to put into that business and she made it bigger before she turned it over to her two sons. And that would be my dad and, um, my uncle did. So there we have the story of uh, women entrepreneurs in my heritage. This is a very successful family. And that's... Well, we're all a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> a present company included. Included. And, and uh, Adele, we should tell mm -hmm. everyone that we've known each other now for roughly 10 years. That uh, yep. in a pr research project that I did 10 years ago, we worked with Adele's firm 
And Adele's firm played a key role in helping us to implement this project. And Adele and I have been in touch ever since. And I, I and the reason, uh, besides for wanting to reconnect with you, that I mm-hmm. wanted for us to meet on Zoom is my mother, when she's talked to me about this manuscript, has said, Matthew, you know, you're a little bit of an academic. Have you spoken to enough business people of what <laughs> their life is and was like before work from home? So, Adele, uh, if I can ask a half personal question. Sure. From your experience in the workplace, and so I've known you since you've had your own firm, had, yep. was there a time, you are still young, is there a time when you were younger, when you were working in a corporate setting in, in 1970s or 80s, in a straight corporate setting? And can you talk at all about, about the challenges that, that, that people faced in the old workplace that work from home might help to mitigate going forward. And and my book is set in a post-COVID world. So it's not science fiction, but it's thinking about the persistence of work from home when COVID is in our rear view mirror. But Adele, my question, when economists think about the benefits of something, whether it's strawberry ice cream or whether it's Diet Coke, we think, what would our life be like without it? What was going wrong in corporate America when we didn't have the hybrid work option? And from the perspective of a successful woman, if I can ask multiple questions at the same time. Great. Oh, multiple questions are the best because then I get to just shoot around the room and bounce off the walls. Um, yes, I worked for a big company. At the time, I worked for FMC, previously known as Food Machinery Corporation. It was in the Fortune 500, to my recollection. And there were, at that time, 58,000 employees who worked for Food Machinery Corporation. And by accident, and I always giggle about this, uh, by accident, somehow I was put on monthly payroll. I was not hourly, I was salaried. And the heavens opened and the finger of God came down and said, what have you done? She is only the second woman within the company to be salaried. And she is all of 20, whatever I was, 26, I don't know, 25 years old. And everyone was aghast. I I thought it was perfectly normal. I was doing the same work as all the guys. Well, I was doing a little bit different because I had a different role. Uh, I was not an engineer and I uh, was not a salesperson. I was the person who translated, so to speak, engineer speak and lawyer speak into usable functioning reports for our clients. So you are living in Hungary, you are running a farm, a large government farm, and you are desperate to learn how to grow more tomatoes and process them. And the people you come to, FMC International, which is where I worked, I was employee number, I don't know, four or five in that group. And we told you how to do it. I have behind me, you can see that big black bookcase in the back, published book after book after book, how to grow tomatoes, how to grow green beans, how to process them, how to ship them, how to market them. The whole story is back there from the 19, um, you know, 60s, 70s. And it, it was an amazing, amazing experience. My background is agriculture. Both my grandfathers were farmers at various points in their lives. Uh, my, one of my grandfathers was also a blacksmith and the other one is the guy who founded the chicken hatchery. So they saw the wave and they went with it. Um, so I had an interesting combination and why did FMC hire me? And it's something that's in your book Uh, You talk about good writing being really crucial in this time of work from home. If we don't write it well, if we don't think it out first and then write it well, we can't communicate. We don't have the cues that, that we have 
when we're face to face and maybe kind of leaning up against a wall and we can say, well, what the hell did you mean by that? You can't do that on Zoom very easily. So you have to think well first, and then you have to write well. And that's the problem that I faced as a reports manager for FMC International. All those engineers, 99999, actually 100% of them were guys. They'd all done technical training. They could tell you how to get more tomatoes from fewer plants in a faster time and better quality. And for many of them, it was a struggle to explain that in the written word. And it was aware, hard. Were they aware of the, their deficiency? Um, they were frustrated by it. Uh, the boss, my big boss, the vice president for that division, uh, said, we have to write reports. It's in the contract because you can't just go to, by the way, I know where Moldova is because we did tomatoes in Moldova. We never got to the Ukraine. We did stuff in Russia. Yes, we did. Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, big projects in Iran, Egypt, lots of fun places. So these guys would go there they get on the ground because that speaks to them. They would run that soil through their fingers. And by the way, I'm a happy gardener. I, I inherited gardener genes. So I totally get it why they had to go run the soil through their fingers. But then came the challenge. They, they had to write it down. Some of them were more comfortable with that. I had some guys who were just very at home and, and at ease with writing reports. They were PhDs. They would had to go through that process to get their degree. We had some other guys who were brilliant, but it never had that, that structure and organization for communication. And you work differently with different people. We also, interestingly enough, one or two people, maybe a few more, who were um, somewhat skeptical that a young female could possibly contribute anything to the brilliant work they had already produced. Uh, I was fortunate in my direct report boss. He was a great manager. He listened more than he talked. And he took a little time with some of these people and said, she knows what she's doing. Um, and she's doing this to make you look better. And it, uh, was it, uh, and maybe. Please. At the time. Did your boss think that you would make a career of it? Were you mentored the way the men were at the firm or that's an uh, unknowable if that's proper English? Well, he was a very unusual man. He was an educator. He had been Dean of Ag at Cal Poly. And so he had an educator mentality. And I, I am an eager student. I love learning. Um, I was raised by a mother who was a, a teacher. She had a vocation for teaching. And she used to say, as she got older, if you learn something new every day, you will never get old. And it's <laughs> absolutely true. I hope so that's I was, true. I was passionate about learning. And when you put a teacher together with a learner, magic happens. He, he stood up for me. Um, you want a funny story about chickens? Um, we had a brilliant young PhD who had to write the animal science report for Oman. We did a project in Oman. And uh, part of that was a breeding flock because the Omanis wanted better poultry. Some of the poultry in the Middle East is very sad. So it not only was an area I knew, but I loved, and I was excitedly looking forward to reading the report. And I got the report and I read the report and I went back to the PhD and I said, um, this is great, but we're, I have a few questions. Uh, question one, where's the roosters? Long pause. We don't need roosters, but this is a breeding flock. We're, we're supposed to have lots of, you know, eggs that make baby chicks. Don't need roosters. Once is enough. Pardon me? He, <laughs> and he got very angry at me. 
So, you know, sometimes it's better to step away and look for a solution that does not involve uh, guns (laughs) (laughs) or tanks. Uh, Putin, I think, is learning that lesson today. At any rate, I went to my boss and I said, I'd like you to read this report if you have time. Otherwise, I will summarize. He said, summarize, please. I said, breeding flock, no roosters. He said, Adele, have you told him? And I went, yeah. What did he say? He said, he said, you don't need roosters. They only have to do it once before the chickens are sent to old man. Thank you. Leave the report with me. I exited the office a short while later. The young man arrived, went into the boss's office, came out a bit later and said, give me back the report. I said, certainly. He rewrote the report. I didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. The girls were now accompanied by boys and uh, we had a breeding flock. So (laughs) So this is progress. This is progress. Let's jump to the present, or at least a decade ago. When you think about your firm, and and I know that you continue to be very active in business, one of the themes I talk about in the book, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as a professional, Mm -hmm. going forward, for firms that develop a reputation for being family-friendly going forward, so Goldman Sachs wants everyone back at the office, and every firm is going to wrestle with how much face time workers put in. A two-part question. In in, in running, and I know you've run businesses, uh, from your perspective, a Do you anticipate, especially for younger workers and for people with young children, will the flexibility of having some remote work, uh, uh, the the ability to continue to engage in remote work, will workers value that very much? And will organizations be happier organizations from, from allowing this to continue? Or is there a scenario where we go back to 2019 and we put Zoom to sleep forever? Wow, that's that's a worldwide big, huge monster question. So the first part, do I anticipate that workers will value flexibility? The answer, short answer, yes, absolutely. It is grounded in <clears throat> a couple of things. Uh, all the young workers I know, several of whom have left jobs and move to new jobs because the old job when the problem the the you know mandates were sort of lifted the bosses started saying great you can commute to oakland san francisco la new york wherever it was they lived near a big city and those workers said no I can't do that anymore. I've had two years of the struggle of working from home. I mean, we all had to get used to Zoom. We had to set up a corner of the house. We had to, you know, some people work from their closets. Some people work from their bathrooms. I spent money and built myself a reading room in the back corner of the, uh, you know, just so I could have a space. Um, I have talked with many of these workers personally, and they've said, I cannot go back. I will not go back. You know, managers can yell at me. And you see, that's part of it. We have this sort of, we talk about the change in workers, but we must talk about the change in managers. Managers managers have to relearn. Do you think they'll be rewarded? Will there be MBA classes on on, on not being... um... A, a Gordon Gecko from that Wall Street movie with Michael Douglas. <laughs> Wait, so have the profit motive, will we have some new age managers going forward who, who understand uh, our biorhythms? Well, you know, we, we make it that sort of fluffy language, don't we? We talk about new age, not Gordon Gecko anymore. Like it has to be one or the other. Um, I think it's more of a continuum. And I think Uh, This is where being a history major is so much fun. In the good old days, uh, oh, say 1450, all the serfs worked on the land. They gave a certain amount of hours that they had to turn up. And the lords 
helper, you know, manager, the guy who managed the farm for the Lord would say, oh, Bob was here, Matt was here, Adele's over milking the cows, fine. They've given their hours of time that were required on site. And then they can go off and do their own thing for a little bit. And then they have to give some of those crops to the, yeah, it was a very great system, it seemed. And the Black Death arrived. 40% of the people in Europe died. So we went from a population of about 90 million to maybe 50 million. And the world changed. Oh, does that sound like COVID? Uh, the workers said, you know what? Um, let me make this arrangement with you. Let me pay off my indenture. Let me just bloody run away and stay for a year in a town. You know, there was a rule like that. If you ran from your landlord, your, your lord, and you were able to stay away for 365 days, you became free. There was a lot of running going on in 1448 through 1455. A lot of people put wheels on their shoes and went. So all of a sudden the balance changed where the Lord had controlled all the resources before. Now the workers controlled the resource of their labor. And that is part of what I expect to see. As you clearly point out, we, we have the issue of an international workforce. So there are people in India and China and maybe soon parts of, of Africa who are willing to take on these, these onerous chores, but they can't work in the building with us. They're gonna to have to work via Zoom. And so we're gonna get pushed that way anyway. It's gonna be very, very interesting. Workers appreciate flexibility. So I'm gonna look at my own family. Um, the person you work closely with, Bob, has moved to a more flexible arrangement, a more flexible job. Uh, Lydia, whom you may remember, works entirely from home. I talked with her yesterday and she said their company is highly virtual. They were in the process of building a second site in California. They went ahead and finished the building. It, the conference room gets used. <laughs> People come in to have a conference. They don't come in to work. So Adele, let's spend a minute there and a question and not a rhetorical question. You and I used to meet in San Jose and, and you would order great sandwiches that, that, to be brought into your business. And so I, I love the local economy there. Yeah. I, when, when I would visit your firm, there'd be several sort of suburban office parks. Going forward, will, what will become of those? If you were to start a new business now, would you just have a conference room? How much yeah. commercial real estate demand will there be? Are, do you, a two-part question as usual. What okay. will become of all of these suburban office parks and is there an investment opportunity? Will they be turned into housing? Uh, if you were to start a business again, would you just have a conference room where, where folks would meet uh, once a week or for a quality interaction versus daily face-to-face? -face? So I'm gonna answer uh, the second question first. If I were starting a business again, I'd have a conference room with a few offices around it, two or three. Because um, there are some people who just need to leave their house and go someplace. It helps them do their job. Uh, and I could afford to do that because my business deals with virtual stuff, non-tangible. Now let's look at my current situation. I work for a company that does print and tchotchkes and it's a 360 supplier for the marketing market. Um, you cannot take your printing press home with you. <laughs> that is not true. I have known in this valley some printers who worked out of their garages, but it was not really a healthy situation. And as soon as they could, they got a place where they could put up the print press, keep the paper, 
all that wonderful stuff. So certain businesses are going to need physical locations and physically working their folk. That's what I call workers on site. Woes, woes. And if we don't treat them right, we're screwed. Excuse my frankness, but you know, that's where it is. Um, what do I think should happen with office parks? Oh my, you said the magic word, housing. Why are we so locked in to a mentality that says a house must be this little four square building and it must be located here and it must have this <laughs> much land around. No, come on people, get real, get real. Think outside the box. And if you do, we have, uh, a place here in San Jose that was just being opened up in the downtown where they took an old uh, brick building and they've made it into housing for people who are unhoused. Uh, and they have central resources for these people. So uh, there's some woes there. There's some work on site folk who have to be there to support the individuals who are living within this new structure. And that makes perfectly good sense. Human beings need to be in community. What's been the big pain of COVID? We've all felt isolated one way or another. And we have seen work as a solution to that problem over the years. We've gotten accustomed to work forming our community. That's where we find our mates. It's where we find our friends. It's where we get our paycheck. That's how we um, met. It's gonna change. It's gotta change. And I, I'm not God. I cannot, I cannot look over that horizon and tell you exactly what's gonna happen, but it's gonna be very interesting. Adele, let's do one last one today. And I think a little bit like Star Wars. I think I want us to have several parts of our trilogy <laughs> together. As That'll a manager, and I know yeah. you've been a successful manager. Yeah. What, uh, going forward, if one's workforce is either completely remote or if folks are just coming to the office two days a week, what will have to be some of the traits of the new manager to actually be profitable and to be a, a, a good boss on multiple dimensions, including profit maximization. In, in a, with a remote workforce, what will be the new challenges managers will face? And so we're sort of coming back yeah. to the MBA curriculum a few or, or for a successful yeah. manager, what will she what will she have to embody to be successful in a hybrid work setting? I think they will have to adapt to the fact that there are many different learning styles and working styles. There are a lot of books out there, as you know, about learning styles. Some people learn through their ears. Some people learn through their eyes. Some people learn by doing. Some people learn, there's like five or six different learning styles. And we have operated pretty much in a one size fits all mentality come to work, whether you clock in with a time card or you clock in by meeting the eyes of your boss or the uh, administrative assistant, that's been the work model. Then you go to your cube or your desk or your <laughs> office and you sit because that's how people work. We are going to have to unlearn that. And I think the hardest job, as I read this book, you were so good to focus on workers, Matt, but I kept thinking about the managers. And on top of that, I kept thinking about the CEOs. What is the metric? What is the metric? You talked about all the money that's going to get saved because we're not going to have to build these, these uh, cathedrals of um, work that exist out here in Silicon Valley. And we're going to be distributed. And there's going to be money saved for the company and workers will take less pay because they can go live in Calusa County or, you know, Boise, whatever. Boise is getting expensive. Um, and I'm thinking, is that what it comes down to? Do our CEOs see the world as, ooh, cool, work from home um, and I'll just rake in more profit and pay myself 
more money. I was intrigued by the company that chose to put together a package uh, for work at home people that involved furniture and hardware and technology and so on and so forth. And I thought that to me was a glimmer of the new manager. That was a manager who walked from behind the desk out into the space and said, what would I need? What would I want if I were gonna be most productive for my company? Oh, I would need this. It's, it's really tough because managers get to decide what the perks are, don't they? So if it's important to the manager, that's what we get as workers. If managers like the fact that we can just walk, they can just walk down the hall and get a sandwich, then we get food on site. If managers like lots of parking, that's what they tend to look for when they went to look for buildings in the good old days. So I think it's going to have to be, oh, God help me, a more cooperative model. And managers are going to have to open up their minds and look at their cultures. I agree with you. It's, I, it's hard. It's going to be hard. I didn't think it was going to be easy. So a theme in the book is, uh, and to tie back to the year 1977, yeah. I argue that work from home is an experience good. And so I talk early in the book about the first Star Wars movie that I never would have mm -hmm. guessed until I saw the first Star Wars movie, how much I'd like these these laser fights in the middle of the galaxy somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so where, where I agree with you is there are many known unknowns with what's gonna happen next with remote work. And for those executives with an open mind who are willing to experiment. So Adele, a very big idea in economics is this idea of experimentation. If there's bosses yeah. locked into a regimen, um, they're going to experiment less. Uh, those bosses who, who admit that they have known unknowns would be willing to tr do, engage in this A-B testing to try different strategies. Uh, an example might be that no worker can come in on a Friday and you can use your big data to see if the firm's productivity plummets or conversely, are the workers really happy with that and raise their game and are less likely to quit and tell their friends that this is a great job. And so the next time we meet, I'd love for us to have a discussion of when are bosses willing to experiment? Is it younger executives? Are women executives more likely to experiment than men? What do we know about the experimental culture? And, and so Adele, as a tease to our million listeners, name two yeah. more themes you want to talk about next time when we regroup. I want to talk about hybrid vigor. And it comes from agriculture, but it also pertains to the broader culture because uh, we've all heard the saying, don't put your, all your eggs in one basket. And with hybrid vigor in agriculture, you're saying don't have just one variety of wheat that you plant all over the world, have lots of different varieties and crossbreed them so that no matter what happens with climate change, you're gonna have some food on the table. So I wanna talk about hybrid vigor. I wanna talk about, um, Doug Adams. You go to Star Wars, I go to Doug Adams. And I don't know if you remember what happened to the planet that got rid of all the telephone sanitizers. That's an assignment for you to go look up. They got rid of two groups of people who were unnecessary. And I can't remember the other ones. I want to say they were hairdressers, but I could be wrong. So I have to go look it up. They got rid of the, hand, the, the telephone sanitizers. Yes, there were telephones, folks, in the good old days, on streets, in little boxes. <laughs> and terrible consequences ensued. Culturally, we can be culturally rigid or we can be culturally flexible. And I'd love to talk about that. We have to be careful, though, because we can be rooted and be part of community and get all the benefits from that, or we can become rootless. And plants without roots die. And so, so I see an analogy here, and that that's, um, 
So, Dell, I'd like to thank you for joining me for segment number one. And, and we, these are going to be a big think talks. I'm going to wave my book at everyone, this going remote book. And we have been talking about several of its themes that the book ambitiously is talking about people, places, and firms. And we've touched on all of those themes today. But, but Adele, thank you so much. And I'm going to stop recording. Okay, you're welcome.